personal responsibility to oversee the rollout of health care. And there wasn't. When Secretary Sebelius appeared in that hearing and she was asked by Marsha Blackburn, right. who's in charge? It took a while for her to answer. And she finally got to uh, the chief operating officer of CMS, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare, and it didn't seem like there was a strong top-down authority system from you. Did you have, uh, do you have, now let's look forward here. Mm -hmm. Do you have a relationship with your cabinet? Did you have a system of cracking the whip that they follow through, they execute as you envision they should? Or do you work through a COO like uh, by Mr. McDonough? What is your system well, for management? Yeah, well, well, first of all, I think it's important to distinguish between this particular project, yeah. this health care project, where it is obvious that we needed additional controls. All right. Yeah, there you go. Uh, otherwise, he's a fantastic manager. Welcome back to the Steve Mulsberg Show, ladies and gentlemen. Joining us now uh, is the woman whose ears must have been ringing uh, when Chris Matthews mentioned her name uh, in that interview with the president, and that is, uh, uh, t of course, uh, uh, Congressman uh, Marsha Blackburn. Hello, Vice Chair, I should say, of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Hello, Congressman. How are you? I'm well. I am well. So you, you hadn't heard that. Uh, what, what do you think of the uh, question and, and of uh, his, you know, his, his answer? Well, a couple of things. It's the question that everybody is asking. Who's in charge? And who is responsible for this? And, of course, uh, the secretary's response, once she finally got around to it and had uh, named Michelle Snyder at CMS as being responsible, then she said, no, I'm responsible for this debacle. The point is this. They try to do things by committee. They do not understand that you lead people, you manage assets, and you use those assets. Individuals use those assets to work towards success. They have completely mismanaged what was an ill-thought idea, and it's worse than anybody would ever have dreamed humanly possible. Yeah. So now they're paying for that. They don't know who's in charge, and the president definitely does not know who's in charge. But what he is very confident of is that it's not his problem. Right, right. nothing is. Uh, you know, it's funny. He finds out about everything in the paper, just like his uncle, who uh, the, uh, the immigration judge said could stay in this country from Kenya. He's been here illegally for 20 years. Uh, originally, uh, the White House had said he never met his uncle, and now it turns out, as the uncle testified under oath, yes, he did. He stayed with him in, uh, for about a week when he was uh, attending Harvard. So, you know, you, you never know what to believe that comes out of this administration. But you and, and, and Congress uh, uh, fellow congressman from the uh, the state of Tennessee, Congressman Phil Rowe, um, are, are are now going to court, filing a, a legal brief um, to, on behalf of a case against the Obama administration and the Affordable Care Act, saying that the wrong uh, the wrong body of Congress uh, put into effect these uh, these tax penalties. Correct? That's correct. You know, and we will see what they have to say about this. Of course. The uh, Judge Roberts said that he felt like the, the Obamacare program was a tax. Well, if it has been deemed a tax, all taxes have to originate in the House, and that provision did not originate in the House. It originated in the Senate. And uh, so we, we will see what uh, happens as we move forward on that. And uh, I think everyone is just... Um, you know, they want to see if we're going to find a way to get some help out of the legal system in uh, shutting, shutting this program down and finding a way to put individuals back in charge of their health care. What people are finding out is the federal government is in charge. They're not in charge, and they really don't like that very much. No, they don't. In fact, uh, the president has lost the support of uh, Hispanics. I, still, I think it's down to 51 from 75 percent in the election. Uh, and, of course, young people uh, who the president is dependent uh, upon to make this thing, in his view, work. They have to buy their insurance, and they have no interest in buying it, according to a new poll. And they're disappointed in the president. They don't believe him. Uh, they don't like him. Uh, I mean, this is turning into a total disaster, as was predicted by the Republicans. Well, that's exactly right. And we knew that there was no way this was workable. And if, when you look at how they have moved forward with implementing this program, you know it really is not workable. And so what we're seeking to do 
is to continue to bring forward ideas that would reform the health care system in a free market oriented way that would put individuals back in touch with their physicians and individuals working with those physicians managing their health care. That is what people want. They don't want the federal government making these decisions. It's not workable, and it's too expensive. We can't afford it. Well, that's for sure. We're talking to uh, Congressman Marsha Blackburn from uh, the great state of uh, of uh, Tennessee here on the Steve Malzberg Show. Um, I don't know if you got a chance to hear um, um, any of the uh, interview with Chris Matthews, but um, when the president was asked about management, one of the other things he said uh, was he said, you know, for instance, the IRS, he says, when a couple of people in Cincinnati you know, want to scrutinize and make sure that the uh, a law, which is written very vaguely. So in other words, he went right back. Um, you know, I, I expected him to blame Benghazi on the on the video again. He went right back and, and this initial explanation, which obviously has been proven to be false and, and insufficient and ridiculous. He went back to blaming a few, you know, rogue uh, agents from the IRS in the Cincinnati office. I mean, it, it's just incredible. Yeah, it is incredible. It's like they have their story. They program their story, and then they don't deviate from their story. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. It's their story, their version, and they are not open-minded, and they are definitely not focused on what is going to be best for the American people. All right, let me ask you a couple more questions here, and uh, then I'm going to let you go. But um, first of all, um, John Boehner yesterday, um, something you, I think you'd be interested in, he, he, he was asked a question, I guess, Republicans are being given, uh, I don't want to say sensitivity training, but how to better be more sensitive in dealing with various constituencies, and especially women. And John Boehner, instead of saying something else that could have been very generic and uh, explained it away, said, yeah, we need to be more sensitive to women. We don't do a good enough job. Um, and we're not sensitive enough. And uh, the, the media jumped right on it. Listen to, this will be cut 19, Aaron. Listen to what uh, Dana Bash said to, to um, uh, Eric Cantor. I don't even know if he was ready. I'm sure he wasn't ready for this, but listen to cut 19. Do you not know how to talk to women, sir? Well, we have any number of <clears throat> Republican women in our conference who are real leaders on, on all kinds but, of uh, issues. But for, for, is, is there a problem with men in the Republican Party, your rank and file, who don't know how to communicate to reach female voters? You know, it, it is our policies that are going to appeal to both female and male voters. But they have when all right. So so I, I think Boehner opened himself up for this now, and this is going to be, you know, it's gone away a little with uh, the passing of Nelson Mandela, but I think this is going to be um, used against all of you guys on the right, on the Republican Party. Uh, you know, I don't think it's going to be used against us. I think that uh, what we have seen time and again is that we have, um, we don't do a, a thorough enough job in thinking through and working through how we mess it. And how many times do you hear from people, well, the Republican Party just does not have a strong message. Everybody talks about different things. They don't focus. They don't address things the same way. And what we're trying to do is get our arms around that and do a better job of messaging. The Democrats will stay on their talking points all day long. You give them point one, two, three, they're going to talk point one, two, three. And sometimes we kind of, you know, will laugh about the fact that they've all got the same word of the day <laughs> or message of the day. And uh, you all hear it from them, too. It's like seminar callers. <laughs> Have them call your show. What we're saying is, look, some of our members are not um, maybe as thoughtful as they should be in realizing you don't categorize women's issues. Women are concerned about every issue, and there is a female perspective to every issue out there. Jobs, the economy, health care are the top three issues. Right, right, which, which is what Cantor was basically trying to say, okay. I guess. And you need to bring that perspective to the table. We are, it is unfortunate for the Republican Party that we only have 19 women in the House. And we only have one female that holds a gavel, and that is unfortunate. And what we are seeking to do, and I, I think that the speaker is right, it's not really sensitivity training, it's awareness training, and it is education training to think of how you approach 
a female point of view and a male point of view of every issue. You know, it's not that dissimilar to what you have seen happen in corporation after corporation around this country. No. Where they no. have looked for female um, board members where they do targeted focus marketing on how women react to different No, no, I, and Congresswoman, I, Congresswoman, I don't have any problem with that. I just think, look, Mitt Romney, uh, in, in making a point to what you're saying, uh, something that should have been applauded by the left, said, I, I, was, I was looking to hire a, a women for that position, so I asked for a folder full of women, and he caught bloody you-know-what for that, because anything that Republicans say will be turned and twisted. So my problem was with the language and Boehner saying, yeah, we're not sensitive enough to women. I just think he opens yeah, it up. I agree with that. Yeah. Well, it, there again, it just goes the the need to understand it is bringing the female perspective to the table right. because women are the majority of the voters they are the majority of the wage earners in this country and our party has been slow to elevate women to positions of leadership and it's time for them to change let me ask you do you think that she was disrespectful dana bash and saying do you not know how to talk to women sir i mean is it <laughs> that sounded bizarre to me well, I, I think that, you know, it becomes one of those things, then you're going to be damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. Uh, and I applaud the uh, leaders of our conference, male and female, for saying, look, guys, we don't do as good a job as we should messaging, and we don't do as thorough a job as we should in bringing a female perspective to bear on every issue of importance of our day. Any any thoughts on the passing of Nelson Mandela, Congressman? Oh, I, I tell you, he was a uh, he was truly dedicated to freedom, free people, and I I think that he was a great man who continued to fight all his life uh, to make certain that that individuals were respected individually. All right, fair enough. Uh, Congressman, I appreciate it. If we don't speak before the holidays, have a Merry Christmas. We'll speak to you again next year. Thank you Merry for all you do for us. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Congressman Marsha Blackburn, Vice Chair of the uh, House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, here on the Steve Malsberg Show, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have one uh, final segment left in the week, the hour, the show, the week, because it is Friday. For crying out loud. Uh, when we come back, I, President Obama said something in his interview uh, with, with um, uh, Barbara Walters, I believe, um, and uh, talking about how, insinuating how rough Michelle had it growing up or something like that. I, I hope I have the right cut because I, I do remember he talked about how poor they were. And uh, once again, this kind of flies in the face of the truth, or at least what has been previously stated by Michelle Obama herself, Michelle's father, Michelle's mother. So, you know, we're going to get to that uh, because it, it, when it's habitual, it's habitual. And when it's habitual and it's the president of the United States and he lies like he breathes, you got to point it out. We'll do that because that's the kind of people we are. Here on the Steve Ballsberg Show, I can't believe it's Friday, but it is right here on Newsmax TV and, of course, radio. Don't go away. The Steve Malsberg Show. Don't complain.